The word lime mud makes me deeply uncomfortable. It reminds me of those nasty jello salads that were popular in post-World War II America. That being said, let's talk about lime mud. Lime mud, or the sediment that will eventually become mudstones and micrite within other limestone, is part of the lithology of most carbonate platforms. A carbonate platform is a broad term for any shallow marine area where carbonate sedimentation occurs. Sedimentation on these platforms occurs primarily in place or in situ as a result of biological processes. This means that carbonate platforms do not rely on an external supply of detritus to accumulate sediment. Carbonate platforms can form in many climates and tectonic settings as long as they are 1. isolated from clastic supply, and 2. in shallow marine water. Since clastic supply disrupts carbonate production and dilutes the carbonate sediment with terrigenous sediment, any depositional area that is exposed to terrigenous supply cannot develop carbonate platforms. Carbonate production is further limited by the amount of organisms that can produce calcium carbonate in a given environment. Most of these organisms thrive in the photic zone, the area of the ocean where enough light penetrates to allow for photosynthesis. If all of these factors are met, then congratulations. You, or more specifically, a combination of chemical processes, some coccoliths, forams, algaes, mollusks, corals, echinoderms, bryozoans, and brachiopods can start to make some lime mud, as well as other forms of carbonate sediment. Speaking of carbonate sediment, let's talk about it. Or, I guess if we want to continue our nasty jello salad analogy, let's talk about gelatin powder. The majority of carbonate sediment is biogenous and created through the breakdown of carbonate shells and skeletons. In our oceans today, the largest contributors of carbonate sediment are forams, coccoliths, algae, and corals, with an emphasis on corals. Since most of these organisms, except for forams and some algae, are absent from cold water oceans, the majority of carbonate shells appear in warm, tropical, and subtropical waters. The smallest of these particles, largely consisting of foram and coccolith shells, can become my personal favorite part of all of this, lime mud. Lime mud eventually becomes micrite, the cement that fills the pores of most limestone. Sadly, these organisms, especially corals, can be super picky when it comes to the type of environment that they can live in. There are many factors to consider when talking about carbonate production. For the most diverse array of carbonate producers, the salinity should be between 32 parts per thousand and 40 parts per thousand. If the salinity jumps above 40 parts per thousand, coral begin to die off, and forams and algae become the major producers of carbonate. As salinity rises, the water also becomes more saturated, and more ooids will form as supersaturation causes rates of precipitation to increase. Like I said, corals are picky. So, at colder temperatures where they cannot survive, calcareous red algae and mollusks form the majority of notable deposits. But since these platforms lack coral, one of the largest producers of carbonate in the modern ocean, they form less often and are less impressive to look at. Aside from the biogenous components, carbonate sediment can appear as ooids and peloids, as well as pezoids, small grains that form around a nucleus. These are generally hydrogenous sediment that is created when calcium carbonate precipitates out of seawater due to oversaturation and forms in layers around this nucleus. On top of sediment formed in situ, clasts can also be deposited in shallow marine carbonate systems. There are two major types of clasts to consider in carbonate rocks. First are interclasts, which are redeposited clasts that were deposited within the same system that they were found. Examples include concretions and mud flake breaches, which are formed either through dolatomization or desiccation and concretion. Second are lithoclasts, or extraclasts. These clasts were likely formed in a different environment and have found their way into the carbonate platform. So, for review, to make our jello salad, all we need is to be isolated from terrigenous supply and to be in a shallow marine environment. To make this jello salad good, we need coral, probably, 
and for that we need the salinity to be between 32 and 40 parts per thousands, we need to be in the photic zone, and we need temperatures around or above 20 degrees Celsius. Now that we know how to make a good jello salad, let's find a nice place to do it. Luckily for us, there are a couple options available in the modern ocean. First on our jello tour is rimmed shelves. A rimmed shelf is a shallow platform with an abrupt end that slopes rapidly into deep water. Along the top of this slope is a mostly continuous barrier that can breach the ocean surface and even form small islands. The lip can be a reef, skeletal sand shoals, and or oolitic sand shoals. Along the high energy lip, ooids, skeletal sands, and the frameworks of reef creatures will lithify into oolitic grainstones, skeletal grainstones, and various bound and frame stones. In the generally lower energy shelf lagoon, skeletal pack and wacka stones will be formed. And on the tidal flats and mud banks of the shore, you will find skeletal mudstones as well as occasionally evaporites. One quick bus stop away on our jello tour takes us to non-rimmed shelves or open platforms. These are similar structures to rimmed shelves but lack the protective barrier and are higher energy environments more often subject to waves and tides. Next on our jello tour, we come to ramps. Unlike shelves, where the slope suddenly drops us into the deep ocean, ramps very gradually dip downwards to the sea floor, only by a few meters every kilometer. On the shore, within the tidal zone, large tidal flats and lagoons form. These can either form together, or they can form separately. When storms hit these ramps, sediment from higher elevation areas will be redeposited along deeper parts of the ramp. At shallow depths, the lithology of ramps is dominated by grain stones formed from the constant agitation of sediment and large bioclasts, such as broken shells. The deeper into the ocean the ramp goes, the finer the grains get until you end up with biogenous mudstone that forms just below the storm wave base. If we sit on this fishy jello bus a little bit longer, we arrive at isolated platforms. An isolated platform can be defined as a shallow platform that is entirely surrounded by deep water. There is no size restriction on what can be considered an isolated platform, but when considering facies, it is important to look only at smaller platforms, as larger platforms can have multiple other platform types represented along their shores. A few isolated platforms may develop rims if there is a high enough rate of carbonate production. These platforms can rise out of the ocean to become atolls, small, thin, circular-ish islands with a deep lagoon at their center. However, to be true oceanic atolls, they need to be formed on calderas of extinct oceanic volcanoes that are being swallowed up by the ocean. The bus driver has informed me that our jello bus just drove into the ocean, so I hope you brought scuba gear, but while we're here, we can talk about drowned carbonate platforms. These platforms occur when a rapid change, specifically a rapid rise, in sea level causes the platform to become entirely submerged. In some cases, the platform will remain in the photic zone, and reefs that are already there will continue to grow and become steep and large barrier reefs. If the platform drops below the photic zone, then a deep water facies will deposit over a shallow water facies. New Jello bus update. Turns out we have a ballast, so we're fine. Next on our decidedly less magical and decidedly more stinky mystery tour, we arrive back at our museum in Longyearbyen, a city in the archipelago of Svalbard, which conveniently has an arctic carbonate environment off of its coast. Here we will take a quick look at the various facies present in shallow carbonate marine environments, starting with lithophases. One of the easiest lithologies to remember from carbonate platforms are the minerals present. Most of the minerals you find will be calcium carbonate, present either as calcite or aragonite, or occasionally dolomite. Aside from that, evaporites such as halite and gypsum are also common. Due to the fragile and small nature of most carbonate sediment, facies can be difficult to identify in the field, and often require petrographic thin sections to identify specific features. A few facies sequences that arise from carbonate platforms are as follows. 
the progradation of a tidal flat will show up as subtidal sediments, those always covered by the tide, underlying intertidal sediments, those not covered by low tide. Lateral progradation can be seen in some reef rimmed shelves, particularly those from older geological periods. These form debris filled breaches that stack up on inclined beds. Turbidity currents and resedimentation of shallow water carbonate sediments into deeper water sediments is a sign of a carbonate ramp, while other signs of resedimentation, such as slides and debris flows, can be seen at shelf margins, such as those found on rimmed and non rimmed shelves. The lithophases in a carbonate system are highly varied, but they will generally share a combination of traits from aeolian, shallow terrigenous marine, fluvial, and deeper marine environments. At higher elevations, traits such as crossbedding from sand dune migration and waves, herringbone crossbedding from tides, and interbedding of grainstone and mudstone in tidal deltas are common. In lagoons and further down ramps, ripples from waves are still common, but many carbonate rocks that come from lagoons are full of bioturbation, making other lithophases more difficult to identify. There are two main takeaways from the lithologies present in carbonate platforms. Facies and lithologies in carbonate rocks are generally pretty cool looking. The second is that facies and lithologies in carbonate rocks can be very complicated. With four somewhat distinct environments that each have their own distinct systems within them, it's no wonder that it can be a little bit overwhelming. So let's go back to our seafood jello salad, which is a little simpler. Earlier in the video, I mentioned a handful of life forms. These life forms are what we are likely to see as biophases present in carbonate rocks. This includes planktonic and benthic forams. These can tell you if the sample is from a pelagic system or a benthic system. Sponges, corals, and other cholenterates, bryozoans, brachiopods, if those are present, it's likely that this rock is from 251 million years ago or more. Mollusks, if there are any cephalopod fossils, then it is likely from before the Cretaceous Paleogene extinction event 66 million years ago. Serpolids and arthropods. If trilobites are present, a type of arthropod, then the fossil is likely from at least 251 million years ago as well as, finally, echinoderms. Sadly, for all the variety of environments that carbonate platforms can exist in, not too many exist today. Not to say that they are rare, but current conditions do not favor these depositional environments. That is because one of the two major limiting factors in the creation of a carbonate platform is shallow marine environments. And because of our relatively low sea level, there are not too many shallow marine environments today. Now, if we were to go back in time, 360 million years, and were to stand right where we are right now, we would be standing on the fifth and final main category of carbonate platform, an apiric platform. Apiric platforms were massive carbonate platforms that could span thousands of kilometers, but due to the low sea level of today's oceans, there is not enough shelf space for them to form. These platforms were largely mudstones, but contained wackestones, grainstones, boundstones, and packstones as well. Since rates of carbonate deposition often exceed sea level rise, the deposits left behind by apiric platforms shallow upward, occasionally ending with thin layers of evaporites. As we wait around this apiric platform for a few million years until our jello bus can take us home, we can take this time to talk about systems that are adjacent to shallow marine carbonate environments. On the shallow side of that spectrum, we have evaporites and aeolian environments. These sometimes get mixed in with carbonate environments due to tides or sea level change and things like that. And on the marine end of the spectrum, there are basin carbonate environments as well as other marine slope environments. It's also possible that shallow terrigenous marine environments will move toward or away from carbonate environments as rivers change their course and currents change, causing either terrigenous on top of carbonate material or carbonate on top of terrigenous material. Oh, would you look at that, it's our good friend the Jello bus. So for one last time, let's review the five main types of carbonate platforms and any other pertinent information. Rimmed shelves, open or non-rimmed shelves, ramps, isolated platforms, and apiric platforms. 
each have different lithologies and different facies, but they have a few key features in common. Biophases are likely to appear somewhere in a carbonate system, as well as signs of bioturbation and trace fossils. Most, if not all, of the sediment in a carbonate rock was deposited in situ. Shallow or higher energy water will tend to have larger and more poorly sorted grains. The largest carbonate systems will occur in tropical inland seas. Hopefully, with the knowledge provided, you have somewhat of a grasp on what a shallow carbonate marine environment is and what it entails.